Okay, we'd like to welcome Nick Taylor into the interview room, making his third career start at the Century. Nick, welcome back. Thank you. It's always a, a great a reward to be here. Just talk a little bit about how much, uh, how excited you are to start the season here in Maui. Yeah, it's there's no better, no better place to start. Uh, we got here a little bit early on the 29th to kind of make a little bit of vacation of it, and um, love starting here. It's it's nice to, to kind of reward yourself from a great season. So it's uh, it's cool to look around. Everyone obviously here has, has earned it and, and played great last year. So it's I'm um, looking forward to the week. And speaking of the great season, I think you were near number 300 in the world golf rankings uh, coming into last season and then just played phenomenally the whole year, including yeah. the win in Canada and a couple runner-up finishes. Just talk a little bit about the season. Yeah, you know, start to finish was, was really consistent. My best year um, by far, I think. I think week in, week out, I felt like um, the game was there, very consistent. And it was nice to get in contention more than once. And I feel like when I've been in those positions in my career, I've been pretty comfortable. And, you know, to be able to win a tournament like the Kane Open that I've wanted to win for a long time in that fashion is uh, – you know, obviously the chair on top of the year. And before questions, uh, not many players have a logo designed for them. If you can talk a little <laughs> bit about how much that means to you for the RBC Canadian Open. Yeah, it's very unique. It's, uh, you know, when I was told about it, um, you know, I was kind of taken back, pretty surprised. And then, you know, the graphic with the video and the call, uh, it was pretty spectacular. So, yeah, it was very, very cool and um, something I can hang, hang my hat on for sure. All right, we'll start with uh, Doug. When you, when, uh, when the new schedule or the new kind of structure was announced at uh, Hartford, I want to say it was 22, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, for a guy who, who has occasionally been in that 70 to 100 spot on the FedEx Cup, what did you think of it within, when it was announced? Only 70 make the playoffs, only 50 yeah, get to the I, next one. I think it almost was a motivating factor. I thought, you know, some years I definitely got caught up in that 125 number. I needed to get that to keep my card to get in the playoffs. And to kind of move your sight up to something different, I think, helped me. It obviously, it's, it's very difficult. You can have a great year and finish 80th, 85th. Um, so I probably had a bit of mixed emotions to start, but I think, again, it, it kind of raised, raised my goals, raised my focus on what I needed to, to accomplish. So I think it helped me personally, but, um, you know, like I said, you, you can have a great year and miss out in the playoffs, which is, which is unfortunate. Do you think more people should look at what kind of year you had, what kind of year... Um, Eric Cole, Adam Shank, uh, the, the, you still have a ball in hand. You could still make it to the places you want to go. It's still up to you, I guess. Definitely. Um, you know, there's obviously plenty of guys here that are world beaters, that are top 20 in the world consistently year in, year out. Um, but there's room for guys like me um, that don't bomb it, aren't that kind of the new age golfer. But there's plenty of golf courses that I can still play really well on. A lot of, I think I could play on play well on a lot of golf courses, but there's certainly a few that, that I prefer. And um, Yeah, there's plenty of guys, I think, in that top 70, top 50 that um, are still really good players that uh, might have surprised a few people, but there's still plenty of room for us. Okay. Okay, Joel. Nick, when you had a really good start to last year, followed by the Canadian Open win, do you have to kind of recalibrate your goals halfway through once you've kind of reached a certain level, or is, do you just kind of keep the same mindset all the way through? It's a bit of both. I've I've recalibrated plenty in my career, but I think last year what I knew did really well was kind of have those process goals of every day of trying to get better. And, you know, as results started to come in the first four or five months of the year, I knew obviously what I was doing was, was translating to the golf course. Um, this year there's, there's a lot to look forward to for me um, with the Olympics potentially, with the President's Cup being Canada, with Mike Gray the captain. There's a lot of emphasis on that for me, but... Also, when I, when I think of that stuff, I've got to reel myself in and, and kind of do what I did last year is, is kind of control what I can control. Um, I'm going to get a lot of unbelievable tournaments this year. Um, pick my schedule. The first year I really have been able to do that. So i got to focus on what I'm doing. But, um, yeah, definitely recalibrate and, and look at that stuff as well. Okay. Sean? <coughs> was there anything that you changed or anything before last season that led to the success or was it just continuation of the progression? It was a bit of both. There wasn't any drastic coaching changes or anything. Dave Markle, a great buddy of mine, started caddying me at the very tail end of the 2022 season. Um, you know, for a long time, I kind of, I think I avoided having a friend as a caddy. I think I wanted to kind of keep that, just a little bit of separation. Um, so when the opportunity came for him to be on the bag, he's just such a positive guy. His golf IQ is extremely high. And so that was definitely probably a factor there for sure. Um, but like I said, kind of changing a bit of focus on what I was working on, 
Um, you know, a minor grip change that really helped with certain stats we're trying to work on. One was speed control and, and that kind of stuff really helped. Um, but a lot of my game had improved, so I think it was, it was a combination of both. And then Phoenix, did that maybe change expectations for this season, just holding your own against those players? Um, or changed what you thought maybe you were capable in 2023 at all? It gave me a lot of confidence for sure. I think, you know, arguably I almost played better in that tournament than the Kane Open, the one that I'd won versus finishing second. But, you know, being in the final group with those guys, you know, I've, I've been in similar situations where, you know, I definitely probably was, was counted out. But, you know, I, I've, in those situations I felt, I feel comfortable. I feel confident that I could do my own thing. I could still compete. Um, so I think... That opened a lot of doors for tournaments I was going to play in for the rest of the year, and but also gave me a lot of confidence. So it was a huge, huge stepping stone last year. Given a compact schedule we have this year, January to, to August, have you? I know you probably set your schedule and looked at it, but do you have any idea how it's going to play out in terms of in terms of fatigue, in terms of yeah. too much, too little, whatever? Um, you know, for me, I'm going to know what I'm playing in you know, three, four, five months ahead that I've probably never really have. Um, you kind of have a schedule tentatively and hope you can get in, say, Augusta and hope certain events. I know I'm in all these events this year, so I'm going to be able to schedule two or three separate two-week breaks, which I typically don't really have. You know, I've, I've played two tournaments really in the last four months, so I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm playing quite a bit on the West Coast. I'm skipping Tory, but everything else I'm going to play. Um, and so, yeah, it'll be interesting how it plays out, but for me, it's the first time where I, I know I'm going to be essentially through the playoffs, so <laughs> it'll be nice for me. And probably understated, and, and what you'd mentioned earlier is the um, trying to get into the Olympics. Uh, when you look at you and Corey and Adam and Spencer, and I'm probably leaving somebody out, how, how yeah. tough is that going to be? Yeah, it is going to be tough. <laughs> um, again, I, if I come back, I, I can't control what those guys are doing, obviously. If I had a gear like I did last year, this year, I'm pretty confident that I'll be one of those top two guys, but we're all so close to there. I feel like it's going to come down to the last putt, you know, whenever the cutoff, I think. I think it's the, maybe the U.S. Open or something. But, um, yeah, I'd love to be there, um, no doubt. This is my best chance. You know, previous years I was the outside looking in and probably had to have some really good finishes come leading into it. But, um, yeah, I, I'd love to be there. I think all of us probably are on that page since it, you know, started in, in Rio that we really wanted to be there. It wasn't really a... You know, if I go, I might go. I think all of us are really passionate and really want to go. So, um, yeah, it'll be really fun. All right, Joel. Nick, you, you know, you've had the ups and downs there just in here with professional golf. Um, now that you've kind of been on the up for you know, almost a year now, what are some things you know now that you wish you would have known maybe a couple of years ago when you were at a different kind of point of that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think in the past sometimes I, I overemphasize maybe some poor rounds, <laughs> some poor tournaments. Um, where last year, like I said, like I, I found things that were working for me, certain drills, um, certain swing keys, and just stuck to them. You know, even if I missed the cut by a couple, you know, looked at it to see maybe what would go on, but didn't over overemphasize it and moved on and stuck to the same thing, same drills. You know, a year later, I'm still kind of doing the same stuff. Obviously, keeping an eye on certain things because things can change in this game very quickly. But um, just sticking to the things that work for me. You know, not looking on Instagram at coaches and certain stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of distractions now, and I feel like I've been pretty zoned in on what, what works for me. And John just mentioned this is your third time here. Is it still a treat for you, or, like, is it now more of a routine or things you kind of expect? Is there any difference in terms of expectation coming here? It's still a treat. You know, it's um, – I, I try to really take time off in December. We typically go back to Canada for a few weeks over Christmas. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be as prepared as I possibly can be, but um, I've probably played my best at times with low expectations. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to win this week, but um, knowing it's the first event of the year, there's going to be a little bit of rust, I'm sure, for a lot of people. But I've been here, like I said, since the 29th. I've played nine every day, so that, that's going to help me kind of ease into the tournament. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's always a treat to be here. I don't care how many times, how many times I've come. All right, Sean? Besides the logo, what are some of the most interesting ways that people have kind of celebrated or recognized the Canadian Open win? I, I've, I've said this a few times in the past. I think just the amount of people that have either come up to me and told me where they were and, and how they celebrated and the emotion that they felt um, just for maybe Canadian, being Canadian if they were Canadian, but even you know people that weren't Canadian, the emotion they felt um, 
just remembering where they were. You know, it's obviously super emotional for myself and my family and my team and stuff. But for the for the country to kind of rally behind that, I think still still I get I get taken back with how many people have come up um, and just kind of shared their story. It's pretty cool. People don't usually celebrate golfers winning titles like their team winning the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup. Like, yeah. were people celebrating it like their team had won a Stanley Cup? It seems like it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of Canadian teams that haven't won a Stanley Cup for a long time, so maybe that was their their, their outlet for the time being. But, um, yeah, just, just really cool. Like, one of the story, there's a guy who was doing a thing in Saskatoon, and um, he's a farmer there and said he was watching on his iPad cutting his crop. When the putt went in, he jerked the wheel, and he still sees the spot when he goes and reminds himself of that every time. Just, like, certain stories. It's, it's just very cool. Is there a spike in Canadian boys named Nick? <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll find out. <laughs> Nick, are you someone that goes back? Have you watched the that last round at all, or is that are you saving that for another day? I have, yeah. I've I've, I've liked watching just to see kind of where my swing is at. Um, they replayed it within the last week or two, um, so my wife and I sat down and watched a bit of that. Um, there's just so many parts, honestly, that throughout that day that are um, you know almost career highlights, and it all kind of happened in one day. So, yeah, it's cool to watch. I've seen it. People have shown me, sent me the putt plenty of times, so I've I've seen it plenty. Can you can you describe the sound? What's that? Can you describe the sound at all of when the putt went in? Not really. I, I like deafening, but also I think I've seen the putt so many times now that I've almost lost my perception of the ball disappearing. Like my my fondest memory is when the putt went in, the like half a second of disbelief almost that it did drop, and then Dave charging at me, and then everything kind of after that. It's kind of a blur. You know, I remember giving Tommy a hug and, and other, <laughs> a lot of it's kind of chaos. Is that the loudest you've, you've ever heard something or have you been in final groups? No, I, I, honestly, else's? there's moments throughout that entire day. I think, you know, when I made putts on 17, 18, were incredibly loud. Um, you know, Phoenix, like, that atmosphere was very unique for, for every tournament um, and very comparable. So there's no doubt that that helped me when I was there that, that week as well. All right. First interview of the year, you're probably worn out. <laughs> <laughs> One more, Sean? Just curious, President's Cup angle, you and Adam finished second at Zurich. What makes you guys a good pairing, and is it games or personalities that mesh well or both? Or? I, it's, it's a lot. You know, our games are quite similar. I feel like last year we, we played really well, but we drove it nice. We were like three yards apart, just like our same distance. We hit similar clubs in the greens. Um, but we've known each other a long time. I don't know why it took us so long probably to pair up. I think we've skipped it on off years and this and that. But, um, yeah, it, it was a really fun week. We, we text Weirzy after the week saying, hey, this might be a good pairing in a, in a year or so. And he said, you bet. So we're, we're obviously both hoping to be on that team. And um, we're going to play again this year and hopefully keep the mojo going. All right. Nick Taylor, thank you for your time. Right. Thanks, John.